Hello, my name's Colin Hendry. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Leeds in the Institute of Psychological Sciences. My expertise is an ethologist. I'm interested in animal behaviour and also human behaviour. And because of that, what I try and do is to explain everything in terms of evolution. This podcast is, a, is about human evolution and it's talking about how our evolutionary past shapes our behaviour today. In this first slide you can see a picture of Darwin and you can see a picture of his most famous book which is of course The Origin of Species and it's unfortunate with Darwin uh, because people look at him and whereas he's anti-religion in many people's eyes in the modern day he actually looks a bit like a god or some sort of prophet or something like that so um, what we need to do is to actually consider him in his own context and um, firstly to say that evolution isn't a religion it's not uh, in competition with any uh, any religion whatsoever it's a thought process it's not even a theory about the origin of life what it starts off with is saying life exists and what we're going to talk about is then the process by which the evolution works on that, uh, works on that life so the process works on a species as they strive and to struggle to survive and reproduce. And because of that struggle, they change because the environment changes and this happens over time and it's in response to a changing environment. So where the environment never changes, the chances are the animal would never, would never alter itself. Where the environment itself is rapidly changing, then that species is also going to rapidly change. And obviously, in the context of what we're talking about today, it's going to be about humans that I'm talking about because we are a species that rapidly changed. How did Darwin come to think about these things? How did he come to think of these things in the middle of the 1800s when his wife was extremely religious, when he was related to the, uh, the, the high-up clergy in, in the church? Well, it was because he was actually a poor student. He was a very bad student and he got moved from university to university. And one of the universities he ended up in was in Edinburgh. And on the way up to Edinburgh, just south of Edinburgh, is a, a rock formation called Hutton's Unconformity. And the interesting part about this is it's well known and everybody can see it, but what it does is just sit in there on the English side of the, of, the, uh, of the Scottish border, it shows you that the calculation of Archbishop Usher, that the world was created at 9 a.m. on October the 23rd, 4004 BC, probably wasn't correct because as you can see from the slide you can see that there are upswellings there are downswellings that the rocks been moved around and on top of that what you have then is the weathering and you can see the water in the slides just there so this is showing you actions over geological time that certainly couldn't have happened in five or six thousand years BC or whatever because Darwin, we only ever see him as an old man, this picture shows you what he looked like as a young man because um, I think it's quite important to understand that he was young when he came up with his thoughts, he was young when he started to develop these ideas and the picture here shows you when he's in his early 20s. So effectively he's a student in modern times who's about to go off on the best gap year that anybody's ever had and the best gap year he ever had was on HMS Beagle. HMS Beagle was a survey ship and it was to go around the world looking at different aspects, basically so the British Empire would know what resources were, were, were there and thereabouts. Anybody who's seen the film Master and Commander will get exactly the idea of this, this sort of place that, uh, that Darwin was on. This slide shows you, uh, first of all, the route. It shows you just how small a, a little cabin space he had. And again, you know, it's hard not to think of these, uh, of these cinematic images. But he went round the world. In the middle of the 18th century, that was an absolutely remarkable thing to do. That was like us going to the moon. It was just an amazing opportunity that he had. And this second slide, it's just an older version of the same map I've just showed you because somehow what it does is to put the atmosphere of, of where he was and the time at where he was, it puts that across a lot better. And it's got wonderful names like Valparaiso and Patagonia and you can see that he went round, the, went round Cape Horn. One of the really important parts is that in that bottom part of South America, he actually started to walk across Patagonia and he actually climbed up into the Andes. And one of the things he found in the Andes, right at the very top of his windswept mountains, in the rock, were seashells. Okay, so there were fossils of seashells. And so there was only one available explanation at the time, which was they were put there by deity, they were put there by God. And 
clearly this wasn't the case as far as Darwin could see. And in this slide, you can see the startings of, of his thoughts on evolution. As he looked at the animals, what he could see that they were similar but slightly different. As he looked at the seashells, he could see that they were similar but slightly different. It looked like there was a common theme that was being developed upon. And these drawings of these little rodents, are Darwin's own drawings and they were taken on his trip into Patagonia. There's a wonderful resource available by the way uh, where all of Darwin's publications, all six million words of them, are available online. The link will be put up later but if what you did was Google Darwin and resources or something like that you'll, you'll find these immediately. But the point is that what there is is a theme and there is changes around that theme and you can see that Darwin is then thinking about how this is happening. How could it be that if God had created all the animals, how come they were slightly changing and how come they seem to be slightly changing in the different environments they found themselves in? And with all that in his mind, the survey ship Beagle arrived at the Galapagos Islands. Okay, Galapagos is named after the tortoises that live there in the same way that Terra del Fuego means land of fire. Uh, the Canary Islands is named after the dogs that live there, the Canaris. Galapagos Islands, the island of the tortoises. So it's actually interesting to think how the tortoises got there in the first place. Actually, they floated. Um, will you believe it that they just actually went across the, across the ocean and found themselves there? But there were also birds there. And most interestingly, from Darwin's perspective, that he was starting to see this variation in the birds. And it was dependent upon the different islands they were on with the different environments and the different foods that were available. Some had short beaks that were just eating seeds. Some had much larger beaks that were needed for crushing things. Some had long beaks that were used to get insects out of nooks and crannies and so on. So we're quite used to seeing all these things now but Darwin saw it in one place in this archipelago for the first time and this was really the place where the theory of evolution was born in Darwin's mind. There are five lines of evidence that species are not immutable. The first one is homology and what you can see in the picture there is that the five fingered limb, the pentadactyl limb, can be changed to all sorts of uses. It can be in a digging tool, it can be a weapon, it can be something that you can use to fly if what you do is to extend the thumbs and the fingers as, as happens with bats and so on. Without going into detail, um, there are sim similarities between the embryos, there is the fossil record, there are vestigial organs, there are leftover uh, bits of equipment that we've got from a previous existence that we don't use anymore. And more to the point, the animal distribution patterns. We can see that if you take a starting point, that the animals generally vary a bit more as they get further and further away from that starting point. And I absolutely love this page. It's out of Darwin's notebook and it shows you the tree of life that he's thinking about. It shows you that he's not talking about a ladder, he's talking about a tree of life. And in that top corner you can see he says, I think, which is just uh, a very great insight into his thinking. This is a graph that shows you the number of people in each of the countries there that believe in evolution, the people that think evolution is the truth. And you can see way up the top there is Iceland, a lot of people in the United Kingdom, and way down the bottom is the United States. So that brings us to the end of the first part of this podcast. And as you can see, there's a discussion point which uh, you may like to talk about amongst yourselves or in the class. Um, it says, Hawaii is volcanic in origin, roughly 2,000 miles from the nearest land. Yet the first humans that arrived there found freshwater fish in its streams and its rivers. How could they have got there given that freshwater fish can't survive in salt water?